Good evening and welcome to Southern Hills this evening. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors tonight. I hope everyone had a chance to pick up one of our announcement pages this evening. If you had not, there's still some left over in the back foyer, and I encourage you to pick one up just to stay up to date on the things that are going on here at Southern Hills. Uh, Bobby Wilhoyt had a fall last week and spent some time in the hospital. She, knew, she is now at home uh, resting, so we, we rejoice in that fact. Also, Billy Wayne Stokes, many of us know Billy Wayne. Um, his father, Thomas Stokes, had a heart ablation today at Vanderbilt, and the doctors say if everything goes well tonight, he plans to go home tomorrow. So we want to remember Thomas Stokes and Billy Wayne Stokes and their family in our prayers this week as uh, Thomas recovers from his heart ablation. Tonight is our last night of the summer series, and our speaker is very well known to us. Dan Cottrell will be our speaker tonight. Um, at the appropriate time, Brother Dan will be bringing our inv invitation to us as well. Also, you'll see on, in the back foyer, there is a sign-up sheet for Wednesday night meals. September the 4th will be our first one. More information about what the menu is and the cost and things like that on the announcement page. I encourage you to sign up either tonight or Sunday, Sunday uh, if you plan to be a part of that. Also, the Adult Bible Bowl Challenge will be next Wednesday evening. I encourage all of our adults to sign up to answer questions and be a part of that. I know it's encouraging for our kids to see, see us be a part of that. That will be next Wednesday night during our class time. Uh, Dan Cottrell will be having a class here in the auditorium um, during that time as well. Uh, September the 5th will be our ladies recipe swap at 6.30 p.m. at the home of Carol Comer. Uh, that's next Thursday. More information about what to bring and things like that are on the announcement page. Uh, those are the announcements that I have for tonight. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for this night that you have blessed us with. We're thankful for this time that we gather around your throne and worship your name. Father, we pray that Everything that is said and done is done in accordance with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first song this evening will be number 191. God will take care of you, 191. The Lord has been mindful of me. 638. <clears throat>
I could ask you to pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we're thankful to you for this midweek time where we can come together and fellowship with those of like precious faith, where we can take a rest from the cares of the world and drink from your word and the message that we're going to hear and the classes that we're going to have. Father, we thank you for the blessings you shower upon us as Christians. Father, we pray that we'll be that light on a hill that people will see and want to know more. Father, we pray that we are different from the world and that our difference makes people realize and examine their own lives. Father, we pray that we might be a help to others as we try to bring everyone lost to the truth. Father, we pray tonight for the teachers, for Dan and for David that have prepared messages. We ask you to be with all of them, that they would have ready recollection of what they have studied that our hearts would be tender and ready to accept what they've got to say. Father, there are many things in our church family that, that are of concern to our members. Father, we ask you to put your shield of protection around everyone at Southern Hills and have your hand in those situations as you as you see necessary according to your will. Father, we pray for Bobby Wilhoyt, who's had some health challenges this week. We pray for their improvement. Father, we pray that the rest of our, our service tonight will be pleasing to you and forgive us of our sins. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take just a couple of seconds here to say thank you to the many of you who have asked about our great-grandson, Wyatt Burns. He got to come home from the hospital Monday about noon. He is doing fine, and we do appreciate your interest, your comments and questions, and certainly Linda and I appreciate most of all your prayers. I want to talk for you, to you for just a moment about your soul. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There are many things that are important to you in this world. There are many things that are important to the Lord our God. But for you and for Him, the most important is your soul your eternal well-being. God loves you so much that He gave His Son to die for your sins and to arise for your justification. God wants you through that Son to have the forgiveness of your sins and the hope of eternal life. And that forgiveness and that hope come through Jesus Christ and His blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. So if you're not a Christian, there will never be a better time for you to become one than right now, here, tonight, by obedience to the gospel, by faith, repentance, confession, and baptism by immersion in order to receive the remission of all of your past sins. So if you are someone who needs to put on Christ in baptism, or if you are someone who needs to be restored to the Lord and His church, or who needs the prayers of the church for whatever reason, this invitation from God through Christ is extended to you. And we invite you to come now as we stand and sing.
this evening. You've heard me say it a time or two before, but it is always an honor to open God's Word and study it together. And I'm grateful for the encouragement that, that I receive, that you're all here, and I know that we are an encouragement to each other, a people who love to come out and learn about God and His will for us. Before we dismiss to our classes, we'll sing number 190, Great is Thy Faithfulness. After this song, we'll be led in a closing prayer. Would you bow with me? Our great and almighty God, we come before your throne tonight thanking you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to sing praises to your name. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to open up your word and be able to learn more about you and your plan for us while we're here on this earth. Lord, this earth is a dark place. There's sin all around us and many times we, we fall into the temptation to sin, Lord, and for that we are sorry. We pray for strength in these trials that we may come across with every day. And for those failures that we've had, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We pray that you please help us to be able to overcome these temptations and be able to get our lives right with you, Lord, the way that you tell us to. We thank you for this congregation here at Southern Hills. We thank you for the leadership. We thank you for this beautiful building we have here to be able to come in and worship you. And we pray that you please be with us as we're continuing to search for a minister. We pray that uh, you send us the man to fulfill this pulpit and be able to proclaim your word here. We love you. We thank you most of all for your son, and we thank you for the example he's given us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. the elbow.
sit down, we'll start Bible class. Always got to be somebody trying to disrupt. Vanderbilt went in Rome. Thought you were true blue Wisconsin, or true, true red, I believe is what it is. And okay, tonight is the last night of the summer series. So we appreciate all the work that was done to get it together. I know that Andy just does, it is amazing at how much Andy and Jennifer do. And a lot of it you don't ever know about, it gets done. That's the main thing, and it gets done well. And this is just a typical case of that. We've had some good speakers, we've had some good topics. And uh, Andy asked me uh, sometime back, would I speak on the summer series this year, and would I close it out? And I told him I would be glad to do that, and he said, I'll get back to you later about a topic. Well, it wasn't too long after that until he got back to me with a topic, and I looked at all the topics, and I believe the emphasis is at least in part on joy. So the lesson that I'm assigned is the joy of the faithfulness of God. Now, I've preached lots of times over the years on being faithful to God, but I really don't recall any sermon that I've preached about the faithfulness of God Himself. But it obviously is a very important topic, or it would not be in the Bible. I have a copy of a book, several of you probably do as well, called Naves, N-A-V-E-S, Topical Bible. And what it does is to list all the categories of things you can find in the Bible. Let's say, for example, God. Obviously, there are lots of verses in the Bible on God, and there they all are, page after page after page. But it has those subdivided into various categories. And I honestly was both pleased and surprised when I just happened to open up the book and look at a page, and there was the sub-theme, the faithfulness of God. And I thought, boy, I've got it made, don't I? So I began to look through all of that, and I did find several verses. I started to try to use PowerPoint tonight. But there are so many verses, it would have taken Linda all day to get all of that typed up. And she does the typing for me because I don't do a very good job of it. But I notice one thing among several. More verses in this particular section came from the Old Testament than came from the New. That doesn't mean one group was more or less important than the other. And what I think is happening here, and I, I have no one to confirm that by, but this is what I think. In the Old Testament, God has chosen the Hebrew people to be His people. He wants them to live according to His will, to honor and glorify Him in their lives. They are a chosen people. And yet, they cannot stand success. Does that sound familiar? They cannot stand success, and pretty soon, they veer off one way or another from faithfulness to God. To the point that sometimes it becomes or is very near to what we know as apostasy. I'm teaching Isaiah on Tuesday nights over at the Nashville School of Preaching. We only covered a couple of chapters last night. It was the first night we had met. And Isaiah is telling those people, you better straighten up and fly right, a term my dad used many times in reference to me. You better straighten up and fly right or you're going to have problems. Well, they wouldn't listen, all of which resulted in Assyrian captivity. They get out of that, some of them, the righteous remnant they're called, get back to the homeland, but not all of them can stay righteous, and so God says again, if you don't straighten up and fly right, you're going to be in trouble, and they don't, and so they are, and you have the Babylonian captivity. There are probably something like 150 years and no more 
between the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity. They just cannot stand success. But all of this in the Old Testament is written to remind them, and I'm going to give you some examples in a minute, written to remind them that the God who has chosen them is the living God of heaven and earth. He loves them. He has a plan for them. He wants them to live their lives in such a way as to glorify Him. And this is the God who is faithful to them. Faithfulness, my definition, not the dictionaries, is the quality of being faithful. God is always faithful. Faithful to Himself, faithful to us, and faithful to all who will follow Him. We're going to see that in the verses. Back in the early part of the Old Testament, for example, there's the promise made to Adam and Eve that they can have a good life there in the Garden of Eden in fellowship with God. There is the promise to Noah through the rainbow that there will never be another universal flood to destroy the whole earth. There's a promise to Abraham, you're going to have descendants like the sand along the seashore and the stars in the sky, and through you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. That's a reference to Christ in Genesis chapter 12. And the promises go on and on and on. And God says to them every time, I will bless you. If you will be faithful to me, I will be faithful to you. Now here's what I want to do right now. I want to begin by talking about God's faithfulness to us. And I want to base that on a particular scripture. If you want to turn there, it's 2 Peter chapter 2. It's going to be verses 3 and 4. I'm applying this to us at the first. Then we'll talk about the verses from the Old Testament and the New Testament as time permits. Then there will be some more application at the end. But as we think about this right now, when God makes a promise, God is going to keep His Word. We will see later on two specific passages, one from Hebrews and one from Titus. They will tell us that God cannot lie. It is not that God does not lie, though He does not, but it is that God cannot lie. He is faithful first and foremost to Himself. It is so opposed to His very nature that God simply could not tell an untruth and would not break a promise. So we learn if we are people who are following God, if we are studying His Word, that we can take Him at His Word because God is going to keep His promises. One of my teachers in Harding Graduate School down at Memphis was Dr. Thomas B. Warren. If Thomas Warren could be described as anything, I guess it would be a Christian apologist. He's one of the toughest teachers I ever had because he was such a logician training us in Christian evidences. And honestly, I don't remember a lot he said about Christian evidences, though I've read a lot on it since then. But the one thing I will always remember Thomas Warren for was this statement. God said it. That settles it. I believe it. God said it, that settles it, I believe it. Now with that as a background, look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Peter says that God's divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now watch what follows. By which have been given to us, now watch what it says and what it doesn't say. Not just great and precious promises, that would be wonderful, but it is exceedingly great and precious promises. That through these exceedingly great and precious promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature, 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God gives us His exceedingly great and precious promises. And God promises to be with us as His children through Jesus Christ. He's going to be with us in the good times, and that's wonderful, but better than that even, He's going to be with us in the bad times. He's going to be with us in times of affliction and trials and temptations and troubles and turmoils and all of those things. Again, the good times and the bad times. Now, I know the verse I'm about to quote applies a little bit differently, but still I think the thought is good. Jesus said what? I am with you always, even to the end of the world or to the close of the age. Okay. Now, here's where I want to start going through the verses in the Old Testament. I'm not going to give you really enough time to turn from one to the other. If you want to write down book, chapter, verse, you'll have time to do that. But otherwise, just listen to some of what the Bible says about this. There are verses through Genesis. We've already talked about Noah and Abraham, and we didn't talk about Jacob, but there were the promises made to him. But let's go first of all to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Know that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God. There it is. The faithful God. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 5, Great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant, keeps His promises, and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Do you remember some time back we had a series here, maybe it was on Wednesday nights, when we talked about the uses of the word covenant in the Bible? Here is God's covenant He has made with these initial people. He is going to take care of them. He is going to bless them if they will do His will and obey His commandments. But this idea of God being faithful, I want you to notice how it just pops up and continues throughout all of the Old Testament. For example, Joshua, toward the end of his life, in chapter 23, verse 14, says this. Says this. Listen carefully to the words. Not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. God keeps His promises. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56, listen to Solomon. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to His people Israel according to all that He promised. There has not failed one word of all of His good promise which He promised through your servant Moses. What does God do? God keeps His promises. David, in Psalm 36 verse 5, speaks of God's faithfulness that reaches to the clouds. David again, Psalm 40, verse 10, I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. Psalm 89, verse 1 is written by somebody, at least it's attributed to somebody, by the name of Ethan the Ezraite. I'm not at all sure who that is. But anyway, here's what he said. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 89, verse 8, your faithfulness surrounds you. Psalm 92, verse 1, it is to declare your faithfulness every night. Psalm 100, verse 5, doesn't use the word faithfulness, but it says the same thing when it says His truth endures. He's faithful. To all generations. Psalm 119 verse 90. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. And Isaiah. In chapter 25 verse 1. Your counsels are faithfulness and truth. Again Isaiah 49 7. The Lord 
who is faithful. It was the prophet Jeremiah who wrote the book of Lamentations. And in chapter 3, in verse 23, he said, Great is your faithfulness. From the Old Testament alone, and I think those are about all of the Old Testament verses we're going to look at, but from the Old Testament alone, if we stopped right there, we would know that God is faithful. We would know that God keeps His Word. We would know that God fulfills His promises, including His promises to us. The same promises to the Hebrews, the same promises through all the generations are in this book which is inspired by Him, and they are promises that apply to you and me just as well. Now then, let's come over to the New Testament. And here again, it's not... Brother B.C. Goodpastor, many, many years ago when he was editor of the Gospel Advocate, wrote an editorial. I think the Advocate may have come out once a month then. I'm not, or I don't know. I forgot. But uh, he wrote an editorial in the Advocate one time on preaching. And he referred to something called shotgun preaching. And he defined shotgun preaching as you've got 20 minutes to preach a sermon and you try to include 50 passages of Scripture. And he said that's not humanly possible, not to do justice to even one of those passages. One of the best sermons I ever heard that man preach was on Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. That's all he dealt with. Oh, he brought in a few other verses. But my point is, tonight, I'm afraid we're taking the shotgun approach, okay? But I think we need to do that because we're looking at the whole Bible, and we're saying, does the Bible say God is faithful? Absolutely, positively, no question, no doubt, He is faithful. So, let's go to the New Testament. I'll be a little bit slower here, John chapter 8. John chapter 8 begins with Jesus and the case of the woman taken in the act of adultery. You know that story. You know how it ends. I won't recount it for you. We don't have time. But his arch enemies, among others, the Pharisees, are doing everything they can to find a flaw in the Son of God. Can you imagine how difficult that is? It's impossible. And so they're on Jesus' case, pardon such an expression, about his relationship to God, which they don't think that he has. And in the midst of all of his response to them, one single verse, John chapter 8, verse 26, He that sent me, that's God, is faithful. Now look, what if I had not read the first Old Testament verse? What if I didn't read another New Testament verse? We have just had the testimony of the Son of the living God. What did that Son say? He said, the one who has sent me is true. He is right. He is faithful. But let's go on. We've got some time. Let's look at some others. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. I, let's see. Sunday I said something about the 1 Corinthian letter. The Sunday before that I said something about the 1 Corinthian letter. Matt, in one of his sermons, said something about the 1 Corinthian letter. We're just about to wear this letter out. We've got to find something. No, not really. As much as we want to use it, that's fine. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, now remember the scene. The household of Chloe has told Paul that the church at Corinth has a lot of problems. They write him a letter, not knowing he knows about those problems, and they ask some questions. And in chapter 7, verse 1, now we've gone through six chapters already. Chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning the things of which you wrote. With Paul, as with the other New Testament writers, is always an introduction and a salutation or almost always anyway. Galatians would be an exception. But in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, at verse 9, 
Listen to what the inspired apostle writes. God is faithful. That's our theme, is it not? God is faithful by whom, God, you were called through the gospel, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. You were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. What? God is faithful. Now, Come on down several chapters in the same letter to where Paul is addressing the questions they've asked him in chapter 10 at verse 13. And there's all that discussion about temptation. No temptation that can overtake you and so on. But notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 the one statement from Paul that applies most directly to tonight. God is faithful. God is faithful. You should never forget, and I know you don't, that that letter and those other letters and those other books that make up the Bible are inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It's God, through His Holy Spirit, directing the writers of the Old Testament and the New Testament and whatever they say, they are told to say by the Spirit of God. Read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. The prophets of old spoke as they were moved or borne along by the Holy Spirit of God. What applied to the Old Testament prophets applies to the writers of the New Testament as well. God is faithful. Now, Paul, in the second Corinthian letter, in chapter 1, verse 20, puts it a little bit differently. But he's saying basically the same thing. He's saying that God is faithful. And to go back to Brother Warren's statement a while ago, he's saying, Paul is, you can take God at His word. You can believe what God says. You can put your trust in Him and what He says. He is never going to be unfaithful. He's never going to lie. He's never going to mislead you. He is going to be faithful in all of His holy counsel to you through His inspired Word. Listen to what this verse says. 2 Corinthians 1.20 All the promises of God find their yes in Him. What does that mean? It means several things. One thing most certainly it means is that God keeps His Word. When God makes a promise, if we live according to the conditions to receive that promise, God is going to bless us and be with us and take care of us all the time. Now, I've got one here I've got to read. I didn't write this this one down. I think I can find it. Here it is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading the paragraph at the beginning at verse 23. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved plainly, uh, blameless, I should say, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here comes verse 24. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. God is faithful. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, we won't turn there, but there is a statement in that verse, chapter 3, verse 3, that speaks of the faithfulness of God. It's happening over and over and over. We're looking at this verse and that verse and several other verses after that. And every time we're getting the same point emphasized to us. I didn't go back to Knaves and count all the verses. I wish I had. There are several of them trying to tell us how faithful the God we love and serve. The God who created and sustains the heavens and the earth. The God who gave His Son to die on Calvary for our sins and then raised Him from the dead on the third day. That's the God who is faithful. He is faithful to us. He is faithful to His church. 
If we will walk in the light of His Word and will, He will bless us and be with us and take care of us, no matter what. Okay, but let's go on. Here's another one I want to read to you. This is from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, if I can find it here. This is verse 13, 2 Timothy. I'm having a hard time getting to it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and it's verse, begin, let's begin at verse 11. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now look at this next verse. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. And then he adds, He cannot deny Himself. The faithful God not only will not, the faithful God cannot, by His very nature, deny Himself. Okay. I mentioned earlier that there are a couple of verses in the New Testament that tell us that not only does God not lie, but that God cannot lie. It's so contrary to His holy and pure nature. Well, one of those two verses is in Titus chapter 1. It's verse 2. He speaks of the God who never lies and tells us that the God who never lies has made promises to us, and if He has made those promises to us, those promises tell us that He's telling us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, because God never lies. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 says the same thing. It just says it a little bit differently because it says there that not only does God never lie, but he goes on to say, the writer of Hebrews does, that it is impossible, impossible for God to lie. I think I mentioned to you this, on sun, this to you on Sunday morning, but let me, let me do it again just in case you forgot it. I went through... The book of Hebrews, I think it was last Saturday morning. Now, by Saturday morning, the sermons are pretty much, pretty much ready. But I thought, I'm going to just look at something. And I started looking at the uses of the word impossible in the book of Hebrews. And the first thing that surprised me was I didn't find it as many times as I thought I might. The second thing that didn't surprise me at all is that every time it's there, it's one of those words that means exactly what it says. It is impossible for God to lie. He is the God of truth. He is the God of promise. And He is the God who is faithful. And He never lies. Well, go on. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19 has an interesting statement. It's almost an aside, but what he says is God is, and this is quoting, a faithful creator. God is a faithful creator. Now, you've heard 2 Peter chapter 3, verse, t- uh, verse 9 many, many times. I know that, but listen to part of it. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. He's not slack. And then finally, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, John says simply, He is faithful. Okay, now, ten minutes to late, we're coming down to the real conclusion. Brother Keeble used to say, as you know, in conclusion. Well, we're going to conclude in a minute or two, maybe. There is in the Bible something we often talk about by referring to it as the plan of salvation. Some of you have heard my story about when I was preaching for the Broadway Church in Paducah, Kentucky. 
I saw an ad in one of our brotherhood papers about a very well-known gospel preacher from out in Texas who had just finished a series of sermons on Ephesians, and he had put those into old-fashioned tape form as it was back in that day, and we could have that whole set for just a very few dollars. So old Dan ordered him a whole set. They got there in the mail one day, and I ran to the office and shut the door and got the tape recorder out and put that first one in, popped that button to turn that thing on, and he was introducing his series. And I'll never forget the first thing I heard him say. He said a few things before this. But he said, I wish my brethren would quit using the term the plan of salvation. Because, he said, you don't find it anywhere in the Bible. And slow as I am, I had to think about that a few minutes. And I guess maybe, maybe, maybe that's so. Maybe you don't find the four words in that exact order, the plan of salvation. But how he drew that conclusion, getting through the very first paragraph, that's pretty long in Ephesians 1, getting through that paragraph, not believing that God has, and I think he did, but he didn't put it this way, that God has a very definite plan for our salvation that was in the heart and mind of God from before the foundation of the world, as Ephesians 1 says. And you can go back to Genesis chapter 1, and you can slowly, steadily, and surely work your way through all of the Old Testament, all of the New Testament. And sooner or later, I hope sooner rather than later, you're going to have to draw the conclusion. God's plan for our redemption and salvation was in his heart and mind before time began. I confess to you, I don't understand all of that by any stretch. And there are questions. Remember sometimes I've referred to that Bible class we're going to have in heaven? When we get in that class, that's probably going to be my first question. Would you explain that to us? But the plan of salvation was in the heart and mind of God before time began. And He worked all of that out through Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, the major prophets, the minor prophets, King David, King Solomon, all of the Old Testament era into the new. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, the others, and above and beyond everyone else, Jesus Christ Himself. God's hand was in all of that, working out His holy plan for our redemption and salvation. Worked out by the, not a, but the God who is altogether holy and pure and wise and powerful and whatever else you want to say about him that's good but who is also the God who is faithful he's the God who is faithful I thought David really did a good job in his song selections tonight when the song the very last one was God's faithfulness God is faithful. In closing, I take you back in your mind to the first chapter of the book of Joshua. Moses has died, never got to set foot in the promised land. You know the story. Buried there on Mount Nebo. And Joshua, Joshua is the new leader of Israel. He's going to take them across that river into the land of promise that will be their land. 
And God is telling him in the very first verses of the very first chapter of the book of Joshua, Joshua, it's going to be a tough job. It's not going to be easy. As some would say, it's not going to be a cakewalk. But listen to what God says. I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. That's chapter 1, verse 5. I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Verse 9, same chapter. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let me turn very quickly here in the closing minutes to Hebrews chapter 13. I looked at this sum over the preparation of this lesson. Hebrews 13, beginning at verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Here we go. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, back in Joshua, that's not the first time. It's been used as a promise from God as early at least as the book of Deuteronomy. God is repeatedly telling His people, I will be with you, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, but go on in Hebrews 13 to verse 5, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Because my God, my God, is faithful. Let's pray. Our Father, we know that you are faithful, and we thank you for that, and we thank you for every blessing and everything that you do for us to help us be the kind of people you want us to be, so that by your grace and wisdom and mercy and love, we can have an eternal home with you. Bless us that we may always know that you are with us. Help us to be with you in the sense that we are faithful to you and that we live according to your will in order to glorify your name and that of your Son and in order to be an influence on others for Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here.